Well, I'm excited about Master Builder. What a great launch. And uh, it's going to be a great kids club. I hope uh, as many people as possible in our church can be involved uh, in reaching out and uh, inviting children here to experience uh, the love of Christ and then to invite their families back on Christmas Eve, which will be another great celebration, which will include the kids. Hope you're excited. Let's pray. Loving Father, we ask now as we look at your word that uh, we would be quick to listen and slow to speak, that we would uh, listen to you and to what you have to say through your word, through the, the teacher, the one that wrote these words, so that we would respond in humility and submit ourselves to Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. So a word of caution from the right person at the right time can prove very, very valuable. This is a dangerous world and there's many things to be careful about. When you go out in the sunshine, make sure you put sunscreen on and a hat. Don't underestimate the strength of that sun. That's good advice, I reckon. Um, when you receive an email that says that you have won a competition, one that you weren't even aware that you entered, uh, don't give your personal details and don't put in any passwords. Word of caution. If you go to the fridge and find chicken there and you know it's been there for seven days, resist the temptation to eat it. I ran a major conference, or helped run a major conference of about 1,500 delegates from around the world in Nairobi in 2013. And Nairobi can be a risky city, so we had to employ uh, top security people. And the main thing about those security people is what they knew. They knew how the city operated. They knew how the underground operated. And they could often warn us. Uh, we put people up in fine hotels not far from the conference centre, just in earshot. Um, however, we also uh, employed buses to ferry people from the hotels to the conference each day. And the people who were in charge of security warned people to catch the buses and not to walk. And even though they believed that they were close to the conference centre, um, it was not advisable for people to walk at the same time across the park to um, come to the conference centre. Well, I'm thankful to say that most people heeded that advice and caught the buses, find nice coaches that we'd, uh, we'd uh, paid for. Uh, but a few thought, nah, I'll just walk it. And most of them made it, but I'm sad to say that some people were mugged as they walked across the parkway, and one man lost his laptop. And as much as I felt sorry for that man, I thought to myself, well, he was warned. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15 says, the ways of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. The wise listen to advice. We continue our sermon series through the book of Ecclesiastes and it takes a bit of a different turn here, chapter 5, where we hear this word of caution. And just as there are dangers in the world, there are dangers when approaching God and we do well to listen to this advice. If you have your Bibles there, please open uh, to chapter 5 and you'll see the outline for my message on the screen there. A word of caution. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. So that brings me to the second point, the house of God. The house of God is where God dwells on earth. It's where his people go to meet him, to pray, to ask forgiveness and to find mercy. The house of God is reminded that God remained with his people. It has a long and esteemed history. It begins with King David, who had a little bit of awkwardness over the prestige of his palace and where he lived. And he complains to Nathan, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. The lavishness 
of the occupy of the of the um, of the accommodation didn't match the rank and the importance of the occupier. In response, however, the Lord, through Nathan, informs David that if he wanted a better house, he'd ask for it. Instead, he promises a house for David. Now, what's this? David already had a house. He already had a palace. But he wasn't talking so much about a physical palace, but a kingdom, a kingdom that would be ruled by David's offsprings, one that would endure forever. And so the focus is not on what a human king can provide for the Lord, but what the Lord provides for humans. And as far as the house of God is concerned, this will be built by David's son, Solomon. And on completion, Solomon brazenly declares, we read this in 2 Kings chapter 8, I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, Lord, a place for you to dwell forever. The house of God would be a symbol to them and to the other nations that Israel was the Lord's chosen possession. In the temple, prayers and sacrifices were made on behalf of the nations, but there'd also be a place where individuals could go to pray, to be with the Lord and pray. The temple was destroyed and then rebuilt and then destroyed again in AD 70 and hasn't been there since. But that does not mean that there's no longer a place where God meets with his people. And I'll speak more about that later. This is the place the teacher has in mind when he cautions to guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Although the house of God was where people met with God, they were, they were never to make the mistake of thinking that he was physically there. God's greatness makes it impossible for him to dwell in a house built by humans. God ultimately dwells in heaven. And so this overriding point of view is where the teacher gets his perspective from. Uh, we brings me to the... Th um, uh, that the uh, point here that God is in his heaven and you are on earth. It's about a matter of perspective. The teacher is humbled by his limited understanding and any of his um, observations that he makes are those made under heaven, under the sun, here on earth. And he repeatedly uses that phrase, under the sun. So such limited vision can never truly make a person ultimately wise. He can only come to his conclusions from what he observes here on earth. He does not at any place in his book here pretend to know what goes on in heaven. All he knows is that God is there. And so God is, from his point of view, so much above us that we should never ever pretend to tell God what to do, right? We should never pretend that we're wiser. If I was God, I'd do this. Never. He is in heaven and you are on earth. And that is the perspective of the teacher. A presumptuous approach to God would prove fatal. Take, for instance, Uzziah, who was the king of Judah during 8th century BC, and he discovered this when he presumed to enter the holy place and burn incense to the Lord. And the brave priests rushed in and gave him a word of caution, saying, you're not to do this, this is the job of the priests. And when Uzziah, the king of Judah, was being lectured to by these priests, he became angry and raged against them. And as he was raging... He was inflicted with leprosy on his forehead. And the leprosy stayed with him until he died. He was permanently infected with it. Why leprosy? Because lepers were banned from the temple of the Lord. The Lord ensured that he would never enter again. So his was a lesson of the care that should be taken when approaching the house of God. You are on earth and you are approaching the one enthroned in heaven. Take care. That brings me to point three. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. 
This is very common wisdom. He, uh, Proverbs chapter 29, we read, Do you see someone who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for them. In other words, a talkative fool is the most foolish. And Mark Twain knew that, didn't he? He said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove or doubt. Even Mark Twain knew that one. Our words can reveal the true state of our hearts and cause all sorts of damage once those words are released from our tongues. And it's very hard to undo the damage. And if it's true in general, then it's even more true when we approach the living God. So go near, not to speak, but to listen. The temple courts became places where various rabbis and prophets would read the Torah and teach, and Jesus himself would teach in the temple courts. People would go there to listen. And the teacher is commending the act of listening as an act of humility. The listener may not accept everything that she hears, but she allows the possibility for growth in knowledge and wisdom when she listens. This is not condemning prayer. Of course, when we pray, we do speak. Although praying without listening is abhorred. Read in Proverbs chapter 28. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. Good prayer is prayer that is informed by firstly listening to God. However, the teacher cautions here in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 about speaking when you make vows to God. Be slow to make vows to God. We see there in chapter 5, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 5, it's better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfil it. But if you do, if you do make a vow then make sure you do fulfil it. Be quick to fulfil and slow to make excuses. The Lord provided for people to make vows, but warned to do so advisedly. I'll read this out to you from Deuteronomy chapter 23. We read there, If you make a vow to the Lord your God, do not be slow to pay it, for the Lord your God will certainly demand it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God and with your own mouth. In other words, you're not forced to make a vow. You are free to make it or not. So if you do make your vow, then you'll be held to account. So then why would people make vows if it was so dangerous? Well, you make a vow so that people will trust you. A person may promise to pay the money back or to remain loyal, to make a true statement or to do a job. And the person who makes a vow effectively says, I'm prepared to personally lose if I don't keep my promise. And they risk perjuring themselves. It's a big deal to make a vow because trust makes others vulnerable. So in order for a bride to entrust herself to her husband, a vow, a pledge, a solemn promise is made. As beautiful as a wedding is, it's quite serious, isn't there? Because they make vows there to love, to cherish, until death do us part. It might look innocent and beautiful and have beautiful music and be in a beautiful building, but very serious vows are made at a wedding. And we should treat them seriously. This is an agreement not entered into lightly, but with proper prayer and preparation. And it is a vow that the betrothed should do everything to make sure that they keep. I know people who knew each other for five weeks and then decided to become engaged. And I'm happy to say that 25 years later, they have kept their vows. I know other people who have taken two years to make their decisions and then 10 years later broke their vows. Reading this reminds me of the promises that I have made before God and his people when I was ordained. 
I promise to teach the scriptures faithfully, to faithfully minister the doctrine and sacraments, to drive away false doctrine that is contrary to God's word, to be diligent in prayer and to live according to the teachings of Christ. I can tell you now, I was very nervous when I made those vows and I'm still, well, they, they weigh on me heavily. So why did I make them? Why did I have to make them? Because no one wanted me to be their leader without making, first making these vows. We want leaders who have promised to do these things. And if people are entrusted to my care, they need to know that I'll do the right thing by them and not intentionally hurt them or mislead them. I pray for God's strength to keep them. They're, they're heavy. So there will be times that we have to make vows, but we do so advisedly and not flippantly. In his letter, the Apostle James, James warns in chapter 5, James chapter 5, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Great care should be taken when invoking the name of God uh, to make people believe you. And in the playground, kids may say, I swear to God that I'll do this or do that, or that I did this or this happened, as if it's a game. But it's no game. Do not be hasty with your mouth. Once it's said, it can't be unsaid. So how do you apply this today? How do we even go to the house of God? Firstly, let's bear in mind that nowhere in the New Testament does there, it suggest that there's a physical house of God. It's not a temple. You don't go to Jerusalem. You go, don't, this is not the house of God, this building here. No, nor is any other church building. Nor is the Vatican. Nor is St Paul's. They are not houses of God. Nowhere in the New Testament does it talk about a physical house of God. No, there's a new approach to God through the sacrifice of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Allow me to read this out. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God... Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So we have complete confidence to approach God. We have complete confidence to enter the place where no ordinary person must go, the most holy place. And we confidently do this because of the ultimate sacrifice that opened the way, the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross. So if that is the new way, the new way to enter the most holy place, then where is God's house on earth? The Apostle Peter wrote to believers, 1 Peter chapter 2, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What an amazing statement that is. God has no intention are living in another house made by human hands. No, he lives among believers, a spiritual house, with Jesus as the cornerstone. God has a dynamic and living presence on earth. And as his people meet around the word of God, he is there. He is here. So just as you would guard your steps when entering the temple, you should guard your steps when gathering with God's people for church, in a growth group or prayer meeting. Firstly, 
I would caution approach, uh, approach uh, against approaching God without spiritual cleansing. How do you become cleansed? Blood was the way that priests would enter the holy place and blood is the way that we enter God's presence today. The blood of Jesus. And of course everyone is welcome here, believer or not. You can enter this church building and join us but you cannot enter God's presence unless you trust in the death of Jesus. Trusting in his death is the way that we are cleansed and prepared to commune with God. And there are people around the world claiming to commune with God through good works and religion, euphoric experiences, whatever, but they don't trust in the death of Jesus. They dare attempt enter, but they have not been prepared. They presume to traipse their dirty sin into God's presence without first having it removed. So be cleansed through the blood of Jesus. That's the work of preparation. That's how we're to caution ourselves as we come to the house of God. Secondly, be quick to listen and slow to speak. When we meet with God, the important thing is not what we offer him, but what he says to us. We may offer him praise, but most importantly, he demands an audience. We listen to the reading and the explanation of scriptures because that's what he wants us to do, to listen. If you do have something to say, then make sure that you have firstly listened. Our words should be shaped and informed by God's word. When we share in growth groups or share in giving a message like this, we must be sure that we're putting in plenty of preparation that we are living daily with the Lord and being shaped by his word. When I travel overseas, the most nerve-wracking moment is when I enter border control. <laughs> well, that's a headache. And I arrive there, had a nice flight. Not. And what am I greeted by but barriers and doors and guards with guns and it makes me very nervous and I check to make sure I'm prepared to enter passport visa what will I say what will I say if they ask me what's your purpose to travel what will I say and so I get to stand in line long enough to think about all this check again <laughs> have I got everything and then comes my moment to enter very nerve-wracking. I still have memories of when I was held over on the US border for over an hour as they continued to quiz me and ask me questions and check my validity. I said to them, I've got the visas, I've got the passports, and they'd say, yeah, but we made the decisions. Okay, sir, I was at their mercy. And then when finally they stamp the passport and you move in, it feels like freedom and you can breathe. Yes, I made it, you think to yourself. And although you've made it all those times before, each time you think it's a miracle that you made it through border control. Well, God invites you to enter, but not without preparation. You must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Entering does not depend on whether the border security got up on the right side of bed. No, we have a faithful and compassionate high priest, Jesus, who welcomes you in. And he says to you, welcome home, friend. You have prepared properly through my blood loving father we thank you that you have prepared the way and lord we pray that uh, we not presume to enter your presence anyway yet humbly but humbly and through the blood of jesus and that we would come prepared to listen and be slow to speak 
And Father, we pray that we'd be cautious with our words. If any of us here have made vows, that we would meet those vows, that you would give us the strength to do that. But most importantly, Father, we'd be even more convinced of the difference. You are in heaven and we are on earth. Therefore, we should be slow to speak and quick to listen to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.